Well, welcome everybody to IAG Trade Talk, a special edition, uh, the Bell 2 inquiry into Star Entertainment, revelations from week one, and what a week it's been. And to help me uh, give this uh, summary, I guess, of the revelations of week one, uh, Managing Editor of Inside Asian Gaming, Ben Blaschke. Hi, Ben. Hey, Andrew. I'm going well. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Ben? And what's going on up there in Sydney? Uh Plenty happening in Sydney, Andrew. It's been a, a very busy week, as uh, well as many of our readers will know, and uh, certainly you know the uh, the second Bell Inquiry into Star Entertainment Group and the Star Sydney's casino license commenced on Monday. And fair to say, it's been a pretty explosive few days. Absolutely. I mean, we were both sort of watching the. I mean, we couldn't. We can't watch every moment of it because it goes all week. But we were both watching Monday morning. Uh, I think we we were sending messages to each other as they were. As as uh, as Nick Weeks was giving his testimony, going wow, wow, oh my god! I mean, he was first up Monday morning, and he just got straight into it. Uh, Conde, the counsel assisting, asked him all the right questions, and boy, did he give some answers. Man, I, I thought you know that it was unmissable to watch the uh, the manager that's been running the the Sydney Casino. That was always going to be very interesting to see his uh, his take on on how that process that that remediation process at Star has been. Uh, undertaking or, or tasked with undertaking over the past uh, 12 or 18 months or so. Um, you know, it's interesting, Andrew, because as you know, I've been somewhat critical of the regulators in Australia for not, not. I mean, I think that we both agree that Crown and Star bought a lot of what's happened onto themselves in terms of their AML failures, their responsible gambling failures. I, I think where I've been critical is putting in place operational um barriers what i might call them to being able to run a profitable business because i don't think that's the intention of what's happening here is to put them out of business in that sense so you know i've been quite critical in that sense but you know conversely watching the inquiry this week you've got to be pretty critical of star themselves for what's come out i mean we were both sitting there on the first day that nick weeks the manager was giving evidence and we were literally saying wow wow back and forth about some of what was going on yeah, it's really, it's, I don't know if there are any winners here. I think everybody's a loser. I think the Australian casino industry is a loser. I think tourism is a loser. A star's definitely a loser. Um, the regulator doesn't actually come out looking great either. And I think in, in many of the ways that you've been pointing out, uh, you know, you could argue they were asleep at the wheel in the early stages, but just sort of zooming in on this week and zooming in on the evidence that we've seen and also as a few people have pointed out we haven't heard the other side of the story yet so we've got to wait until we hear um cook or, or foster side of the story but just on the surface of what weeks came out with uh on monday morning some pretty shocking stuff i mean for those that didn't uh didn't hear let's get into it i mean uh maybe i'll let you rattle off the three or four things that were the most amazing well, I mean, I think that you and I messaged each other on Monday when Mr. Weeks was giving his testimony saying, I think we now know why the New South Wales Independent Casino Commission called the second inquiry. This sort of lays it all out on the table. It explains a lot as to why there is a second inquiry. And some of the main allegations based were really based around the breakdown of relationship between the star, particularly CEO Robbie Cook and Chairman David Foster, uh, and the regulator and the special manager. So what we were basically learned is that Star was not really, didn't form a proper relationship with the manager, um, considered them to be a bit of an outsider. And, and even the evidence came out that uh, it seemed that Star considered the regulator and the manager perhaps be conspiring against them. I think the term they used were they're preparing for war and they said, let's go to war. So they literally said, let's go to war with the regulator and messages back and forth to one another. That's amazing. You would think that part of the remediation process would be to work closely with the regulator. We've seen we've seen a complete opposite with Crown Resorts, who recently won back their licence uh, in Melbourne, and the regulator was quite complimentary of the hard work they've done. And all the, you know, what we've heard behind the scenes to Andrew has been very positive about the work that Crown did, how they work closely with the regulator, all that sort of thing. But in New South Wales, we've seen the opposite. So that's um, that was one of the main things that we, we heard from all of that uh, on Monday was about, you know, breakdown of relationships, going to war, uh, and then in a moment, we'll get on to some of the other things that were revealed about you know, what's been happening on the casino floors at Star as well. And Ben, I know on that day one, you did two stories. There was also one about 
uh, pretty amazing thing. Well, t- there were there were two pretty amazing things that came out about on the uh, the the gaming floor. The this this Tico thing and also these welfare checks thing. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it revealed on uh, day one of the inquiry. Uh, well, yeah, as you say, a couple of things. Uh, probably the most shocking thing was that Liquor and Gaming New South Wales were conducting some inspections of the Star uh, late last year, I believe it was, and had observed uh, a player playing for more than three hours. Of course, under new regulations, there needs to be welfare checks on players every three hours. They're supposed to take a short break after three every three hours or so. There's time limitations. So, Liquor and Gaming... Sorry to interrupt you. Do they have to take a short break or do they just have to be checked upon? Uh, they might think... just have to be checked upon. I'm not sure about that, but let's leave that hanging. Yep. Um, Sorry, I interrupted your flow there, Ben. Apologies. Yep. So they so the, the, they they were meant to do this welfare check on this guy. So, yeah, supposed to do the, the welfare check and um, Liquor and Gaming News as well has observed that there was no welfare check done. So they went to look at records, but they found a number of cases of records. In this particular instance, the record said a check had been done, and they looked back through records and found a number of instances, and they they checked it, cross-checked with video to find that there are a number of instances where players had played for three hours. There was no welfare check done by the the team responsible for those checks, Uh, um, but the record said there had been a check done. The video showed opposite. So fabrication of records was uh, and around a very important area. You know, we're talking about responsible gaming here and the, the new regulations around that. So in the middle of, you know, apparently remediating, they're fabricating records around welfare checks. It was pretty amazing itself, isn't it, Andrew? And then at the same time, they found that there was a, in the, the TICO machine, the ticket in cash out machines, a fault was discovered in, in one or two of those machines. And I think the fault was basically if you put in more than one ticket at a time, it would pay you for those two tickets, two or three tickets, but it would give you one of those tickets back that you could reuse. So it's just people could just constantly reclaim money that wasn't theirs. It was uh, basically spitting out cash. So as the story goes, and there were some local media reports uh, this morning actually saying that people started to get wind of this and people were coming in and, you know, groups of people coming in and claiming cash. And it took, uh, I think it was around six weeks to pick this up. It cost them 3.2 million Australian, uh, was withdrawn uh, that wasn't supposed to be withdrawn in that time. Uh, and, you know, pretty amazing thing to happen. So, I mean, I think the all of the controversy around this wasn't so much that there was a fault, those things can happen, but that, you know, Star Systems didn't allow this to be picked up for six weeks, which is pretty incredible. And then it was also revealed by you know, a few former Star staff as well that management had tried to conceal what had happened or certainly spread out, you know, in, in the books about exactly where and when this had happened. So, you know, pretty, pretty incredible happenings this week i'm i'm really lost for words but uh i'm kind of lost for words because you're leading an organization you're allowing this sort of basic stuff to happen it's quite incredible and uh i mean as for the fabrication of records on those welfare checks uh, what were they thinking i mean this is i mean all eyes are on them right now and uh you would would want to do everything as right as much as you can. I think the culture there is in real trouble. There's real problems with the culture. Robbie Cook, the CEO, is obviously gone. Now, there's all there's more information. I've been listening this morning, and I know you've been out, but I've been listening this morning to, um, this is Thursday morning, we're recording this Thursday around lunchtime, to the evidence of Dr. Uh, Attractor Lagan, her name is. Quite impressive, actually. I didn't know who she was. But she is a sort of, I think she's a consultant from a transformation, from a company um, that helps transformation. And she uh, has done work with both Crown and Star. And in her evidence this morning, so Condé's been um, examining her this morning and asking her the questions. She's been highlighting some of the, the differences between Star and Crown. And it's been like chalk and cheese. I mean, Crown's obviously put a lot of effort into trying to fix themselves up and make themselves suitable. They spent over 200 million US on that. Uh, They had Blackstone behind them to to do that. And they really seem to have gone about it in a good way, in a positive way. And Star's the exact opposite. And one of the things that she mentioned was, uh, coming back to this Tico fraud that cost Star 3.2 million Australian dollars, she highlighted that if the culture wasn't what it was, it may have been picked up earlier. Uh, and what did she mean by that? She talked about some of the cultural issues at Star. So broadening that out to those cultural issues, there was an issue of just 
get it done no matter what. Like just get it done, even if you have to do a workaround, even if you don't do it properly, just get it, get, you know, get the box ticked basically and do whatever you have to do to get the box ticked. Uh, she mentioned uh, under-resourcing, that the place is very under-resourced. They've lost 500 people because of the cutbacks. She said that Robbie Cook was working like crazy, but he was focusing on saving the business through those capital raises that you wrote about, I think, earlier this year or late last year, was it, Ben? Uh, last year, a number last of capital year, was it? And they got a few hundred million dollars there from capital raises, um, or maybe even close to a billion, right? Over 500 million in total, I think, was it? I can't recall the exact amount. Yeah, anymore. but it was, it was hundreds of millions anyway, and they needed that money. And she mentioned that, um, you know, that probably saved the, saved the business, but at the expense of cultural change. She described a culture of fear within the organisation. She also described a, an us and them mentality. A really, she talked a lot about us and them. So instead of taking Nick Weeks, the special manager, um, well, I think he's special manager in Queensland. I think he's just manager in New South Wales, isn't he, technically? But um, instead of taking him on as a resource in a way, as, a, as an asset, which is exactly what you would do, you'd go and see him and say, right, you know, you're here now, help us with this change and work together with him because he kind of represents the regulator side of things and the regulator is the one that's going to be making the decision on whether you're okay or not, ultimately. So you want to work with this guy. Uh, they treated him almost as an enemy. They treated him as as the them, as the us. This us and them culture uh, emerged, not giving records, being very closed, not communicating, not even. I mean, we've commented that Star hasn't communicated externally. They weren't even communicating internally. They weren't even telling. Um, well, even we had um, um, the former CFO, Miss Katsububa, yesterday, um, saying that. She wasn't even told of things. And she's the CFO, which is like the next most senior executive after the CEO. And she wasn't even getting things. So it's really quite shocking uh, to, to see what's been going on there. And, you know, I do, we, we do have to say, well, let's wait and see the other side of the story, which I might come out in evidence next week, I guess. I guess, are, are they calling Robbie Cook and David Foster? I presume they are. Yeah, they absolutely will. They haven't actually announced, uh, they only announced this week's first of all, who would be appearing this week. And actually, from what I can tell, it's been running a little bit over time. I feel like we might be, this inquiry might run a little longer than originally planned. There's been a number of uh, witnesses running for multiple days. Uh, so yeah, um, I believe Robbie Cook and David Foster are pegged to appear. Uh, might be a couple of weeks before they do. And, and as you say, Andrew, we, we definitely have to hear their side of the story. I mean, we're just hearing certain things but i think the common theme as you mentioned is the lack of communication throughout the organization um now even miss katsububa mentioned um, mr cook was reluctant to tell the board about the true financial state of the company and, and true you know concerns around that i mean you would think that particularly in the current environment uh that there's you know full transparency should be running throughout the organization now, this would be critical i would think to to cultural transformation and all of these things and, and why wouldn't you i mean look at look at Kieran Carruthers at Crown, he came in as a ch well change agent and as a new person coming into the organisation, you're free to admit the sins of the past. They're not your sins. They don't reflect badly on you. So why try to cover those things up? I mean, just, just being Machiavellian and political about it for the moment, get it all out. Get it all out, all the bad stuff out because it wasn't you. No one's going to blame you. And in fact, they're going to praise you for being so open and transparent i mean you don't want to trash the reputation of the of the of the of the company too much but you also want to admit the sins of the past and create a, a transform the organization to a new organization with a new culture and uh, why wouldn't he do that robbie cook i don't understand why wouldn't he come out and get all your dirty linen out now well while you can i it just it, it's staggering to me and here they are they've got no ceo again Hmm. I mean, that's one of the other things. I think uh, Mr. Weeks brought this up on day one. Was and it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a circle, really. I mean, there's problem becoming problem, and it's all in a bit of a loop at the moment. But you know, one of the things he spoke about was the absence of leadership has made it very difficult for Star to achieve some of the things it's trying to achieve. So, for example, the three properties Star has in Australia: the Star Sydney, Star Gold Coast, and Treasury Brisbane. 
Uh, they were each of those of that was without a property CEO for most of last year. In fact, uh, I believe a couple of them are only officially starting in the next month or two. So there was no property CEOs to put in transformation throughout their individual properties. Now there's no group CEO either. So, I mean, the, at the time when they need their leadership the most, they've got none. And uh, I mean, it, it, and it's all while also dealing with the, their financial situation. I mean, I, I, I can imagine it, missed, you know, Robbie Cook must have been under a lot of pressure with everything he's dealing with. So you know, I think we should recognize, as you said, that, you know, it was testimony was given. He was working incredibly hard, but, you know, perhaps the fact that Star let 500 people go because of their financial situation um, didn't really help the cause in terms of transformation. You know, it all, um, you know, you, you got to cut to save the business, but you're affecting its ability to keep its license. It's um, yeah, very challenging scenario all around. Well, you'd have to think, I mean, we've got to speculate on it. I mean, David Foster, you'd have to think his days are number two, but they can't get rid of him. And then there'd be no chairman, no CEO. I mean, uh, until they get a CEO, a group CEO anyway, and there's some actings. And I even believe the CEO for Sydney is not yet the, officially the CEO for Sydney because she's still um, Janelle. Um, her surname's just sk skipped my mind at the moment. But so somebody else is acting as a CEO. She's got to go through regulatory confirmation. So, yeah, as you say, there were no CEOs at the property level and there, there was at the group level. Now it's flipped the other way around. There's nobody at the group level. Uh, Foster has to um, step in to be the acting CEO, even though he's the chairman, which is never a good thing. And uh, his reputation is kind of trashed by Week's testimony, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. and, and all of the star employees are listening to this, no doubt, and they were not kept in the loop. I mean, one thing that Dr. Um, sorry, I just, her name just slipped because we just watched it a moment ago, Lagan. One thing Dr. Lagan said was all the staff, the line staff, the middle managers were working incredibly hard and had their hearts in the right places. And we're trying to do, she said, people generally try to do their job as best as they can to their ability. That's the default position. But they're not being supported by leadership. Leadership's not telling them what's going on. There were no transformational culture. There's been no effort done to bring people along on the journey. There's been policy changes, which have been uploaded to some website that all the employees are meant to read, but they haven't got time to read it because they're so incredibly busy. So mm. yeah, where, where to from here? That's the big question. I mean, we talk about the need for leadership. It's going to be impossible to bring in any new leadership before the end of this inquiry. And you'd have to say without preempting that, Star's probably Star's license is looking more precarious than it ever has before. I'm not going to preempt what the finding might be, but there's no doubt it's more precarious than ever. Uh, you know, I think they need to wait and see what the finding is. You know, from Star's perspective, hopefully they get another chance, but they need a complete refresh again. And is the regulator willing to do that again? There are all these many questions lingering now. I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen over the next few weeks. What is it for me once, shame on you, for me twice, shame on me? I mean, is the regulator prepared to give them a, not a second chance, but a third chance? I mean, the, all of this thing, uh, you can sort of understand all of the stuff they did wrong in the first place. Of course, it's wrong, but you can sort of see how culturally within Australian casino industry was crowned at it too. It just evolved over the decades and it became the SOP, I guess. But when the... Um, the proverbial hit the fan and it was like, okay, this has got to stop. You've got to reinvent yourself. Crown's gone off. Oh, okay. Yes, boss. Oh, let's do it. And stars just done nothing or, or very little. So, or they've gone about it the wrong way, or maybe they've had the wrong people or all of the above. So for the regulator to give them a third chance, it doesn't look good. You'd have to think it, you know, like you said, we shouldn't preempt it, but You'd have to think it's on. They're on very, very thin ice, and who and who on uh, God's green earth is going to want that job, CEO of Sydney? I mean, I was talking to a few other people about it recently in the last twenty four hours, and there are companies, of course, I won't name any names, but there are companies circling that have a, had a look at at Star because I mean, what are they? I know you've got shares in Star, and they're almost worth nothing now, right? So I'm oh, sorry, sorry to gloat, sorry to gloat. <laughs> But um, hopefully, well, a lot when I bought them, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we can't sell them now. There's no point. May as well just pray. Um, but what are they down to? I think they're down to 
I mean, the market cap's under a billion now, and I think it was like three or four or something at one stage. Or no, even five. There was five and it was down to one and a half. Are they under a billion? Because their shares are plummeting now as well, right? Well, and I know that their shares were at one stage in their heyday more than five dollars and now they're in the low cents. <laughs> so we're not um we're not looking good. Talk about value destruction, you know, in 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 casino uh, in an integrated resort. So who's going to want to do that job? I know there are companies companies that have been circling, going, well, we could pick this up for a song, but nobody wants it. Everybody takes a look at it and goes, well, there's a reason why it's so cheap. I mean, this is a minimum minimum five year remediation. So, uh, and remediation is probably too weak a word. I mean, it's a it's a total rebrand maybe and total start from absolute scratch i mean I suppose and again let's let's get into speculation because that's our job i suppose the only company that kind of makes sense is blackstone because they don't have the slot machine license in in sydney do they they can't have slot machines star can have slot machines could be quite useful yeah i i that's very interesting about what might happen you know in the in the worst case scenario for Star, where they lose their license, or if there's a judgment that you know we're talking about, they might break up the assets. Or there's many ways this can play out. But if you're going to bring any other operator, or you're going to even you know Blackstone come in and take over like they did with Crown and bring in an operational team, the question is, I mean, this is where I was critical a little bit of the regulator and the operational conditions they've put in. Would anybody come in and look at those conditions, look at the losses that Star is making, and say? Yeah, that's a business we want to buy. So that's another question. Uh, so, and, and then we start to look at what if there was no star or whatever anybody took it over, and that's an, that's a scenario you don't want either. I mean, there are, there's nothing positive looking ahead at this stage. No, there's, there's no good outcome. I mean, the only thing I would say is a synergy. I mean, I describe Blackstone as a synergistic buyer because of the only because they have their own problems in Sydney with Crown Sydney, which again is not fit for purpose really. I mean, it's beautiful property and everything. And you and I have gone and had a beer there. It's a lovely place to go, but it was built for a market that no longer exists. And so there's got to be a conversation. And Kieran Carruthers said this, didn't he? Had the regulating the game conference when he spoke, you and I were both there. He said, once we get our license back, maybe we'll be in a position to have a talk to the New South Wales government. Now, I think what he was talking about was the financial viability of Crown Sydney. But now, with the situation that Star's in, maybe there's another factor to, to that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that'll be, that'll be very interesting to see. And, you know, perhaps, as you say, if uh, Blackstone did come in and then they could somehow work, see how Crown Sydney and Star can work as a synerg synergistic I almost said that word correctly. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Uh, properties working together, there might be some sort of foundation there they can work on. But I mean, there, there are so many what ifs at the moment, really. Yeah, we just have to wait. I mean, we, we're doing this video because it's been such an interesting week, but we just have to wait to see what happens next week and the week after. And he's due to report at the end of May. So uh, hopefully we do get a report at the end of May. And then June could be, I guess, a very interesting month uh, to see what what happens at star but spare a thought for the employees of star they must be demoralized right now yeah absolutely and i mean i'm from sydney i've been going to star for many years i've you know done some work there i played a lot of poker there i know a lot of people there i know people that have been laid off there i know people that are still there so it's very sad to see um, what's happening and I, I do feel for the you know the many thousands of staff who are just probably wondering what's happening to their job this is not good news for them to be reading for their morale every morning so you know I, I mean that's also to play out too what happens to them um you know i think that a few of the experts were spoken to a few of the analysts and former regulators were spoken to have said that you know if a tender was put out for a new operator then the government would probably keep the casino open and in the meantime um under maybe under a similar arrangement now with a manager running it but um we just don't know i mean there's so many different ways this could play out well, it's interesting you say that about Sydney. I felt much the same about Melbourne. I spent a lot of time in Melbourne. I know Crown Casino extremely, we call Crown Melbourne, very, very well. Um, lived across the road from it for many years, literally uh, under a minute walk uh, to the mahogany room and uh, felt much the same. And in, and, and in a kind of ironic way was rather proud to see them get their license back. I think it was, I think it was good what they did. It was quite impressive how they brought themselves back. Still got a lot of long way to go, but at least they're to the starters gun now. 
star isn't even to the starters gun. And as you say, you don't want to you don't want to have no star because now we're back to the pre-casino days, and all you'll do you'll get illegal casinos popping up in Kings Cross or out west or out east or wherever it might happen to be. That'll happen too. So it's really. Um, yeah, it's a no win for anybody. It's an interesting, interesting time. And let's just see what happened next week and next month. Absolutely. All right. All right. Well, we'll sign off uh, from this uh, very interesting special edition of Trade Talk. We'll have more next week on what happens in Sydney. Who knows? We may be seeing the first time ever, and certainly my memory of 37 years in this industry, of a major integrated resort, potentially losing its license. So let's see what happens. Um, that's We're not there yet, but it's probably the closest we've ever been. So uh, that's it from uh, me. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Yeah.